Good morning. The title of my message this morning is The Accountable Pounds. I mean the pounds that must be accounted for. Now, I'm not talking about some weight loss program where one has to account for every calorie, every pound gain or loss. Sometimes we justify or account our weight gain as water retention or the big meal that we just ate. That should account for at least two or three pounds. Now, it is not this kind of pounds. Rather, I'm talking about the pounds in one of the parables of Jesus Christ. As you know, Jesus used many parables during his ministry on earth. This morning, Pastor Jim has designed a new sermon series on the parables of Jesus Christ. So I thought it would be good if we review what a parable is. Now, the word parable is actual transliteration of the Greek word parabole meaning to cast alongside. You may recognize the prefix para, meaning alongside. See, parallel is two lines along each other. Parachurch is an organization that functions along the church, alongside the church. So a parable is typically a story that is to cast alongside a truth, to clarify the truth or to amplify the truth. A parable typically has one or two overriding truths. Today's parable is called the parable of the 10 pounds or minas. Now a mina is a unit of weight approximately one pound. The central truth of this parable is a parable about salvation. It is the accounting of one's salvation. So I call this the parable of the accountable pounds. Now, people in general don't like the idea of accountability. As human beings, we just don't like being accountable to anyone or anything. Yet we're being held accountable every day of our lives. We're accountable to our boss or employers. Children, you're accountable to your parents. Students, accountable to teachers. And all of us are accountable to our pastor and elders. As husband and wife, we are accountable to each other. As citizens of this country, all of us are accountable to its law. Today's many protests in the street, I believe, is due partly due to our resistance to accountability. In many churches, there are accountability groups. In fact, my two daughters belong to such group. They would meet regularly and accountable to each other regarding to their Christian walk. George Bernard Shaw, author, playwright, actually winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1925, he once said, that all people should be obligated to appear before a board every five years and to justify and give an account of their existence. Now, this is a very scary thought, isn't it? Yet there is still a scarier thought. There is even a greater accountability. Now, what do I mean? Well, all human beings, Christians or not, are accountable to God our Creator. Someday we will see our God face to face and we will have to give an account of how we live our lives on this earth. Someday God will ask us Christians how we live out our salvation that has been given to us so freely. So Jesus Christ teaches this parable of the 10 pounds recorded in Luke chapter 19. It would be good at this time if you turn to your Bible to Luke 19, and we'll read our text a little bit later. If you have your Bible open, you will notice that Luke chapter 19 begins with Jesus Christ making his way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Now, within days, Jesus Christ would be crucified on the cross. On his way to Jerusalem, 
Jesus passed by Jericho, and he encountered a chief tax collector named Zacchaeus. In fact, he saved this tax collector. That's the first 10 verses of this chapter. Jesus concluded this story with these words in verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is a primary message of the kingdom of God. Now, following the story of Zacchaeus, Jesus told this parable of the ten pounds. Now, this is just one of the many parables that Jesus Christ used to explain the kingdom of God. After this parable, Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, often known as a triumphal entry. The people welcomed their king and shouted, Blessed is the king comes in the name of the Lord. Ironically, this chapter 19 ends with the religious leaders and the chief priests plotting to kill Jesus Christ, the last few verses of this chapter. Now, it is interesting to note that this parable is sandwiched between the salvation of God, the story of Zacchaeus accepting God's salvation, and the religious leaders, on the other hand, rejecting God's salvation. Now, whether one accepts or rejects God's salvation, all will be held accountable to our decision, you see. This is the main teaching of this parable, the accounting of salvation. Again, the title of this message is The Accountable Pounds. Our text this morning is Luke 19 from 11 to 27. Would you please follow along as I read? While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, meaning Jesus, a man of noble birth, or some translations a nobleman, went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then return. So he called ten of his servants, and gave them ten minas, or pounds. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him, and sent a delegation after him, saying, we don't want this man to be our king. Verse 15. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had done with it or what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my servant, the master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina, or pound, has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Verse 20. Then another servant came and said, Sir, he is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you, because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reap what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put money on deposit so that when I come back, I could have collected it with interest? Verse 24. Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has more will be given, but as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Would you bow with me and pray? Father God, we thank you for this parable. We thank you for this word of truth, Lord.
There's so much in here, Lord. We pray that you will open our eyes and, and give us a heart of obedience that we hear your word uh, as we hear your instruction for us. So, Lord, we ask that you will speak loud and clear to us. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Before we go on with this parable, it should be noted that there is another similar parable recorded in Matthew 25, often known as the parable of the talents. Now, sometimes we are confused between these two parables and therefore the interpretation of both parables. Though there are similarities, but they are two different parables. More importantly, both parables complement each other in its teaching about the kingdom. Now, to be fair, there are some Bible scholars who believe that these two are the same parables, but just told differently by Matthew and Luke. Now, I take the view that they are different parables, as you shall see as I go on with this passage. Now, in the parable of Luke, all servants were given the same amount, one pound or one mina. See, the nobleman had 10 pounds for 10 servants, presumably one pound each. Now, a mina, or one pound, is about three months of working salary. Now, in the other parable in Matthew, a different amount of talents were given. One servant was given five talents, one given two, and the other one talent. Now, a talent is about 20 years of working wages. Now, the different magnitude between the talent and the pound will be self-evident later. Nevertheless, both parables speak of the theme of accountability. Whether we are given talents or pounds, the recipients are still responsible what has been given and what has been received. You see, it may be a different amount, but the same accountability. The parable of talents in Matthew teaches faithfulness to the talents given. These talents symbolize the spiritual gifts and the riches given to us. Again, a talent is equivalent to 20 years of working wages. It is God's tremendous riches given to us. Apostle Paul teaches that we all have different gifting, but we all have at least one gift given to us. We are therefore accountable to the different talents given to us. We are to use our gifts faithfully in proportion to what is given. Now, in this parable of the pounds in Luke, all servants receive the same amount, one pound each, or one mina. Again, it's equal to only three months of working wages as opposed to 20 years of wages. Therefore, the pound refers to the basics, the, the basic thing that we need to become a Christian, the basic necessity of beginning this Christian life. The pound represents the salvation, which is eternal life. This salvation is given freely and by grace, as illustrated in this parable. See, everyone received the same salvation of God. Your salvation, my salvation is the same, same eternal life. What we do with this free salvation is a the theme of this parable. We are expected or held accountable how we live out our faith in our daily lives. We are to live as faithfully as possible to the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to tell others about him, and this is the most basic part of our faith. Then after salvation, God then will lavish on us much riches and gifts symbolized by talents. Again, the important thing is that we are equally responsible to our talents and to our pounds. So in summary, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 teaches accountability of a given spiritual gifts. The parable of the pounds in Luke 19 
is accountability of our salvation that has been given to us so freely. The parable, or this parable in Luke, is the accounting of salvation and not the accounting of spiritual gifts. The question is, how does one give an account of this offer of salvation? In this accounting of salvation, it can be separated into three categories. The rebellious, the unfaithful, and the faithful. Some people will rebel. We reject the offer of free salvation. Some are unfaithful to the salvation given, and some are faithful to it. In fact, this is the basis on my outline this morning. The rebellious, the unfaithful, and the faithful. After this long introduction, let us now study this parable. This parable begins with a nobleman going away into a far country to receive his kingdom. You, you kind of scratch your head. Look at verse 12. A man of noble birth, birth went to a distant country to have himself appoint a king and then return. Now what does this mean? Now this scenario is quite unfamiliar to us and maybe even seems strange, isn't it? We have nothing to relate to in our modern times. But in the days of the Roman Empire, Rome would often appoint a puppet king to rule over certain territory that they conquered. The appointed king had to go to Rome personally to receive his kingship. Remember around the times of Jesus Christ, at his birth, King Herod the Great, he was the king over Judea at the time. He was appointed by Rome. In fact, he had to go to Rome. But after he died, one of his sons also had to go to Rome to receive the kingdom, just as his father did. It was also customary at that time that if the citizen of that area or that country object to the appointment, they can actually send a delegation to Caesar to argue their case. Verse 14 says, his subject hated him and sent a delegation after him and say, we don't want this man to be our king. Of course, Caesar had the final say. Now, this is the background of this parable. Now, in this parable, Jesus Christ is that nobleman. Jesus Christ has promised his kingdom by the Heavenly Father. Jesus has returned already to the Father to receive his kingdom. And someday, Jesus is scheduled to return to establish his kingdom on earth. So Jesus Christ is talking about the time between his ascension back to heaven and his second coming. In other words, this parable is about the present church age, where salvation is offered freely to all people. We as Christians have certain responsibilities and tasks until Christ return. We can be faithful or unfaithful. You see, when Christ comes back, both believers and unbelievers will be held accountable to this free offer of salvation. Yes, this salvation is free, but we all know it's not cheap. It costs the life of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. See, God the Father will hold us accountable for the precious blood of Christ that he shed on the cross for our salvation. See, all humanity will be judged someday. All people will be held accountable whether we reject or receive the gospel. For Christians that have received God's salvation already, we are responsible how we use this free gift. We are all accountable to the pound of salvation given to us. Of course, as Christians, we are also accountable to the talents and gifts as in the parable of the talents in Matthew. Point number one, the rebellious. In this accounting of salvation, one category is what I call the rebellious. The rebellious are the unbelievers. They reject the offer of salvation. Verse 14 says, we don't want this man to be our king. Basically, they reject the king. In this church age, the gospel is available to everyone. 
Jesus Christ sacrificed his life and died on the cross, shed his blood for the forgiveness of sin and the salvation of all mankind. But there are many who will not accept the gospel. There are many who will reject the salvation offered to them. In fact, Jesus Christ once said, broad is a way right, that leads to eternal destruction, but narrow is a gate that leads to eternal life. Apostle John adds, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. John 1, 11. See, many people will not only reject Christ, they even hate him as their ruling king and savior. Verse 14. But in our society today, there are many people who not only reject the name of Christ, but they openly hold his name in contempt. Not too long ago, a female talk show host in the program called The View. Some of you may have seen that program. This talk show host actually said online, on air, that Christianity is a mental illness. Wow. Franklin Graham responded that this kind of attitude ought to cause great concern for us Christians. Many Christian leaders are warning that the persecution of Christians in this country is coming. As you know, it is already happening in the other parts of the world. These are indeed the rebellious, the rejectors of the gospel. They are basically saying, we don't want Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. As in this parable indicates, these rebellious people will be judged. It is a judgment of death. Verse 27, But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Well, some might argue that, hey, if this nobleman represents Jesus Christ, then how can Jesus be so ruthless? Well, in, in the interpretation of parable, or in any parable for that matter, we must be careful not to carry the analogy to the extreme or allegorize every item in the parable. One is to focus on one or two central truths. One central truth of this parable is that unbelievers will be judged with eternal punishment. Those who reject the gospel in this church age will suffer eternal death. But please remember that our God is a righteous judge. He will always judge all things justly and rightly. Abraham acknowledged in Genesis eighteen twenty five, Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will, you see. Second point, the unfaithful. The second category of people in the accounting of salvation are what I call the unfaithful. Now, before the nobleman went away, he called together his ten servants, suggesting that these servants belong to his household. Correct? They already had a master-servant relationship. Many of us already have a master-servant relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, this, this parable applies to us since we now belong to the household of God. Now, this man gave each of the ten servants one pound, or one mina, again symbolic of salvation. All servants received the same amount or the same salvation of eternal life. Then he gave the same responsibility to each servant during his absence. They were told to trade with their pound given to them. In other words, they are expected to do business and put the money to work until he comes back. Look at verse 15 with me. He was made king and he eventually returned home 
The Bible said, Then he sent the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. See, the first thing this nobleman did was to find out what his servants had done with their pounds. The nobleman wanted the accounting of his pounds, you see. Of the ten servants, Jesus only mentioned three specifically. See, these three represents the actions of all ten servants. Some traded faithfully and wisely and made additional money. Some unfaithfully, they did not even attempt to invest the money at all. Verse 20, one servant came to the master and said, Sir, here's your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. See, this unfaithful servant just stored away the money. And when the nobleman returned, he just handed back his money. Was he lazy? Possibly. Was he not smart enough to invest the money? Possibly. Was he distracted by his personal interests and not the interests of his master? Possibly. But one thing is for sure. He was unfaithful to the task that was given to him. He was given certain responsibility for the pound that was given. He didn't do anything with it. If he did not know how to trade, he could have given the money to the professional trader. Or at least, as the Bible indicates, at least put the money in the bank to accumulate interest. So he was basically unfaithful to the task that was given to him. Now the reason for his unfaithfulness was his misunderstanding of his master. He didn't know his master. Brother and sister, let me ask you, how well do you know your master or our master, our Lord Jesus Christ? You know him well enough to please him. Verse 21, this unfaithful servant said, I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. Oh, this servant didn't know his master well. His heart was not right with his master. He saw his master as a hard man, demanding, unfair, reaping where he did not sow, exacting profit from everyone. He saw his master as a slave driver. In fact, he feared his master so much that he didn't want to even take the risk of investing the money, fearing that he might incur the wrath and the anger of his master. Instead, he just laid it aside, put it in a safe place. The master was rightly angered. He took away the pound, from this unfaithful servant and gave it to the one that has 10 pounds. So what is a lesson for us? Well, some people receive Jesus Christ simply as an insurance policy from hell, right? You may have heard some call this a fire insurance. After salvation, they do nothing or do minimally just to get by. Or they may come to church once a, once a week or they may give a little offering. Then they go home and live the rest of the week as they please. They are not only unfaithful to the pound of salvation, but also unfaithful to the talents and gifts given to him. As all servants, we too have been given our pound, or mina. You and I have granted salvation and given a new life in Jesus Christ. See, we are expected to live this new life faithfully for the kingdom of God. We are to invest our lives in His kingdom and use every opportunity to witness, to serve the Lord. Of course, in addition to the pound, we also have been given what? Different talents and gifts to serve the Lord. But many times we waste our opportunity to invest for the kingdom. Some just keep the pound, just like this unfaithful servant. 
Some of us may even bury our talents. You see, though we may not lose our salvation, but we will certainly lose the reward of faithful service. If we don't use the pound and the talents that God has given to us, we will lose the honor and the joy of serving our master. My third point, the faithful. See, the third category of the people in this accounting of salvation are the faithful. Now, in this parable, Jesus only mentioned two servants who traded faithfully. But these two represent all the faithful servants in the kingdom. Please note that the nobleman did not promise any reward, did he? The servant was just told to trade with their money. However, the Bible does teach that faithfulness is expected of all servants and stewards. As believers, we are also promised a reward for faithful service. Furthermore, these servants were not told when the master will return, only that he promised to come back. These servants just acted faithfully as good stewards during his absence. Upon the return of the master, the accounting of the, the pounds began. One servant invested one pound, and the Bible said he made ten pounds. The other servant invested one pound and gained five pounds. And this is remarkable. One pound and made ten pounds. Now, this is 1,000% return of investment, isn't it? Priscilla is an accountant. And she told me, this is how you look at it. It's 1,000% return. Where do you find investments like that? I would certainly like to know what stock they were trading in or what investment vehicle that he was trading in. The other servant made five pounds. Equally impressive. Now, although the return of investment was different, but both servants pleased their master with, a, with words of commendation. They were also rewarded accordingly. Both were given additional responsibility in proportion to the investment return. One was given 10 cities and the other five cities. I think verse 17 summarizes this very well. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities and five cities. So what is a lesson here for us? We Christians live in a time between the ascension of Jesus Christ and his second coming to earth to establish his kingdom. This is basically the church age that we are living in now. We have been given free salvation and a new life. We are responsible and accountable to live this life as profitable as possible for the kingdom of God. Someone has said, we only have one life to live. Make it count. You know, we all live this life differently. Some live their lives as missionaries, evangelists, in, a, in such a way to bring lost souls into the kingdom. Some serve as full-time Christian workers, pastors, and teachers to build up the body of Christ. Many of us are called to a business world, to industry, to government services. Some are called to schools, and some of you are called to stay home, right, to nurture the next generation of God-fearing people. The important thing is that we are to be faithful to the task given to us. We are to invest in our pound of salvation. This parable also teaches that if we are faithful in little, we'll be faithful and trustful in bigger tasks. See, all faithful servants will be given additional tasks and responsibilities. Some Bible scholars believe that in a future kingdom, all Christians will be giving stewardship or rulership. That's the meaning of co-reign with Jesus Christ. 
So the degree, the degree of faithfulness now on this earth will determine what task will be given to us in the future kingdom. Let me summarize. The major theme or the central truth of this parable is that all people, both believers and unbelievers, are accountable to our Creator God on the life that we live on this earth. Those who reject God's salvation will be judged to eternal punishment, and those who accept God's salvation will be rewarded based on faithfulness. As stewards of God's grace, this is an Apostle Paul's term, as stewards of God's grace, he writes in 1 Corinthians 4.2, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy or faithful. See, if we are faithful in living out our lives during this church age, we will also hear Jesus Christ's commendation. Well done, you good and faithful servant. Come into the joy of your master. Let me tell you a little story. A man had a dream that he died and went to heaven. At the pearly gate, he was met by St. Peter and was welcomed into heaven. So Peter took him to his heavenly home. As he was walking down on the streets of gold, he, oh, he saw houses of different sizes. Some are big and huge late mansions. Some are average size, and others are like little tiny shacks. So he was so excited and wondered, what kind of house am I going to get? Finally, he got to his house. Oh, he was very disappointed that he got this little tiny shack. So he asked Peter, Hey, why? I've been a good Christian, haven't I? And Peter explained, Well, we build houses by what people send ahead, how you invest in your future. See, you send little material while you're on earth, and that's all we have to work with. Brothers and sisters, what are you doing with your pounds and your talent? Are we faithful or are we unfaithful. We have only one life to invest for the kingdom. Invest this life well. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your precious word, which is eternal, applicable, relevant. Though it is written 2,000 years ago, Lord, it is relevant today in our lives. Lord, may your word this day, through this parable, challenge us that we will not waste our life on worldly pleasures, on selfish things, but we invest our lives for the kingdom of God. That someday when we face you, we will hear your words. Well done, faithful servant. Come into the joy of your master. Thank you for this promise, Lord. Help us, enable us to be faithful in the task you have given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.